I would like to talk, as you can see, about something that apparently, you know, is far away from what we were talking about, but I think it's connected. And I think uh, it, it is uh, not that much well known. At least it was not known to me when I saw it. And then I thought, well, maybe it's worth exploring that. Uh, so I'm talking about InsurTech. And now, what is InsurTech and why is that related to damage assessment, in particular in personal injury uh, cases? Now, in the, word, in the words of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, which is one of these global uh, standard uh, bodies, uh, InsurTech is the variety of emerging technologies that have the potential to transform the insurance business. So essentially, whatever is connected to digitalization or uses of artificial intelligence uh, in, insure, in the insurance sectors is part of InsurTech. Um, and uh, I'm just referring, just to be clear, I'm just, from now on, I will be just looking to Europe and I will be just looking into the European insurance market of incumbent companies, meaning the old traditional insurances that are going digital. I'm not dealing with other developments that are even more crazy from my point of view, such as, for instance, the development of peer-to-peer -peer insurance, which is where we make a pool by private people, uh, which is totally contrary to the traditional rules of ins supervised insurance in Europe, or other strange startups uh, creating new system. Like I'm focusing on the old traditional insurances going digital and going, you know, uh, adopting new technologies. Um, and now um, it's quite unclear what insurances are doing. We were discussing before in the pose about the invisibility of the insurance market. But it is clear that European, even incumbent companies, even the very old ones, uh, they are using and relying more and more big data analytics and artificial uh, intelligence, for sure, in telematics insurance, which is mostly, uh, we all know it because it's related to car, like uh, the, all the new pay as you drive, pay as you drive model. This is, you know, basically based on data uploaded by the car itself, and then the insurance is able to calculate premiums or something. So this is a very specific sector of telemetric insurance of behavior based insurance. But then there are also more generic use of new te emerging technologies throughout all insurance sectors. So no matter which kind of insurance it is, um, which are essentially related to um, the, you know, advertisement phase. Uh, so at the very beginning of insurance, even before there is insurance contract, so to do, for instance, target advertising and to do the good placement products to the good people. Um, and then there, the other like uh, phase of insurance supply chain that is really impacted by these new uh, technologies is the claim management phase. So it's when people uh, either in uh, first part insurance or in third part insurance somehow contact the insurance and ask for reparation. And here we have all the sector of damage assessment uh, and of the claim settlement process, uh, whereby there is a huge uh, use of, uh, of new, new technology. And that's the segment I'm interested in. So I'm interested in particular in the use of automated means to check, for instance, the reasonableness of clients' requests. You know, you ask for, you have a medical receipt, you send it to your insurance, and you have machines that are scanning that and saying, well, it's reasonable, it's not, it's strange, uh, that doesn't fit into the average, et cetera. So this is uh, one example, but then there is also technology that allow to quantify the compensation hold based on study on previous dossier. So you have many European insurance companies that are now using big data analytics, machine learning, and whatever you can imagine over, over past dossier or over past judicial rulings in order to then detect what's the average uh, and what are the features that matter in compensation or that might matter in order to propose uh, an amount, very, to propose very fast an amount uh, that then uh, people might accept, uh, or even to understand what are the variables that make people accept a certain amount. So that's the so-called claim optimization strategy. So where you are trying to detect what's the minimum amount you can propose to somebody for that somebody to accept it, uh, which is, I know, very, very bad from the point of view uh, of uh, personal injury lawyers, but quite understandable from the point of view of insurance companies because they really would like to know, you know, uh, how to minimize what they have to pay while at the same time compensating the cost. And even there are some insurance companies that are then automatically executing payments. Uh, now, all of these movements are 
more clearly evident in the property damage sector. So uh, really in, when you have like a car damage or a home uh, damages uh, or even travel insurance. Uh, in these sectors, really, you many times you have everything automat automatized. I don't know why I look for help for the English speaking, but automated. Um, it's it's much less common in personal injuries. That's true, but uh, it might be. I think it's, it starts being common also also in personal injury cases for low injuries. I mean, not really for the serious cases where where you want that there is a human being dealing with you, uh, and where technology problem is just supporting uh, the insurance employees. But where uh, for minor injuries that that is happening more and more now. Why am I discussing that here? Because, you know, on the one end, that might seem to be the promise of the perfect combination of standardization, because you have machines saying, you know, that's reasonable for one person who has suffered this kind of accident, it's reasonable, it's standard to get that. And at the same time, personalization, because these new algorithms are also able to take into account so many variables that they can actually fit. Uh, I mean, in theory, uh, that it seems at least that they can actually propose an assessment that is really for you, that is really personalized and uh, perfect for the uh, for the person involved. Um, and this is partially what is told. I think, however, that there are more problems. I mean, that this is partially true, but at the same time, that we have to be really aware of certain limitation. Um, and I see particularly two big limitations I would like to share with you. So the first one is that this idea that machine-driven insurance decision can combine standardization and personalization, well, it's more a myth than a reality. It's more what we would like it to be than what it actually does. Uh, so that's one point. And the second point is that this reliance by insurance companies on automated decision-making to assess damages and to propose claim settlements and negotiations. Uh, well, results in decisions that most of the times are more rigid and much harder to challenge than traditional human driven decision. And that's a problem as well. Let me try to be uh, trying to be briefly. Let me start with the uh, with the first point. So uh, if uh, we said, you know, given the ability of algorithms to consider a myriad of variables, it's usually thought that uh, these new big data driven, artificial intelligence driven world would be a very much customized and personalized world where technology will be able to propose every person exactly the treatment uh, that they might need. Uh, but this is based on the idea that with new technology, these new technologies have the ability to kind of uh, perfectly depict uh, and, 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 and capture people's identity. Uh, and I think that's, that, and I mean, I'm not the only one, it's not my opinion, it's the opinion of others, uh, that actually this technology, this technology doesn't really work this way. It's not that our identities are perfectly depicted by technology, it's that these technologies reconstruct, they remake our identity by creating algorithmic data doubles that actually have very tenuous factual linkages with what we are and are based on correlations uh, that uh, to, to features that to us are not personal at all. Like for instance, you know, the personalized treatment I might receive might be connected to the speed of the internet connection I'm using on average or to the kind of software version I have installed on my device which is not something I would say define my personality. I mean, but maybe I'm wrong and the, ma and the machines are right. Uh, <laughs> but it's just to say, you know, we think they are personalized and to some extent they are, but they are not personalized in the way uh, we imagine uh, they might be. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of personalization might be somebody using that browser, that device, and that version is more likely to have an emotional back breakdown after a small car accident. And therefore, you know, we, we propose immediately something. Uh, on the basis of that. So this way of working is a radical departure from what insurances have traditionally done because insurances have always used standardized factors that are absolutely true, uh, but standardized factors based on drawn on previously unfair causal links between certain factors and the probability that certain individuals will suffer certain losses or will react in a certain way. While by contrast, the new emerging technology suggests stereotypes based on correlations. Uh, and well, you have, I cannot go in detail, but I love that one. one that is a correlation about the fact that, you know, a lot of people 
uh, in the summer eat ice cream and some people in summer are eaten by sharks. And then if you're not able and you have no contextual data to interpret that, you will <laughs> deduce that eating ice cream leads to people be attacked by sharks or, uh, you know, it being attacked by sharks leads people to eat ice cream. Uh, and if we are able to, you know, to interpret that, it's just because we know many things around and we have other insights that allows us to see that this is just uh, spurious correlations and it is not uh, causation, but the machines might, might need a lot of time to learn that uh, and a lot of uh, trial and trial and, and error. And just to, just to give you an idea of how scary it's going now, some insurance companies are trying to evaluate, you know, working on biometrics uh, and trying to evaluate how um, people having certain haircuts might live a longer life uh, than others. Uh, which, you know, I really don't want my insurance company to decide how much compensation it's going to be on the basis of my haircut. <laughs> also, because if you really think about it, the haircut is related to uh, gender, it's related to ethnicity, it's related to your social status. I mean, it has a lot of biases in it that actually are conveyed through an apparently objective thing, such as haircut. Um, and this is the other problem, actually, with, uh, with this kind of algorithm, which is bias. Uh, but, oh, pardon, pardon, I went too fast. Why bias? Because uh, since most of the times they are trained um, on past data, so past dossier, insurance dossier, past settlements, past decisions, they, this kind of uh, technology announced work is very likely um, is very likely to do what is called discrimination by proxy, meaning it's very likely to pick up the usual factors for um, certain minorities to be mistreated and keep mistreating them even more because that's the amplification that is typically related to uh, to technology. Now, as, 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 um, as I said, if you take, for instance, a, a, an apparently objective variable such as the aircraft or an apparently objective variable such as the speed of your internet connection, uh, then that is very likely related to how rich or poor you are. Uh, and, and therefore, the amount of compensation that may be offered to you that might be lower or higher, if that is one of the variables that matters, just depending on your economic status, which might further, you know, create the circle of uh, it making, being, uh, ex, uh, keeping at the margins, those who are already uh, at, the, at the margins. Now, another problem related to that is that any automated discrimination uh, in a world in which people interact with machines and interact with you know their own device and chatbots and screens is that this kind of discrimination is very hard to be perceived uh, it's very hard to be perceived by those who suffer that and it's very hard to be seen even from outside because everybody receive a personalized treatment and therefore any kind of comparison i mean it's not very easy that i can say oh i got more or less than you did uh because actually our situation are not the same i don't even know you are in the same situation like me we don't find ourselves in the same office you know waiting for the same uh for the same insurer to talk with us um and therefore you know all of that makes makes it harder for people to react which leads me to my second uh my the second reason why i think all these technological announcement is actually in the insurance sectors uh, might actually be more challenging than than promising which is automation makes it harder for people to react makes it harder for people to go against it actually shift the burden of uh, um, of proving the, the legal and factual basis of a decision. I mean, computer says no, okay? So then you have that, and you need to prove that the computer was wrong, rather than the opposite, you know, that whoever says no has to somehow give you a reason that this is the reason why you are not getting what you what you think. And let me let me now try to be a little more like legal because I understand that much of that might not look legal, but I have now legal provisions on the slides, so that that, that will turn out to be uh, very you know norm based by showing you how much um, the existing and very soon to be uh, enacted uh, legal architecture uh, in Europe dealing with this kind of automated decision making, notwithstanding all the effort of the legislature, is actually not really going to help. Now, uh, those, whoever is using uh, you know, big data analytics in insurance in Europe has to comply with the GDPR. That is very well known. And you probably are all familiar with that provision, which is a very famous provision in the GDPR uh, on automated decision making saying whoever 
uh, uh, creating certain safeguards for uh, whoever is the subject of an automated decision. And well, it's well known that these safeguards can be very easily bypassed. So it is enough that the decision is not fully automated, but that there is one person at a certain point uh, intervening in it to be outside the scope of this provision. Uh, and it's also true that uh, we are outside of the scope of this provision whenever there are all the conditions mentioned in the second paragraph. But uh, let's forget all of that and let's focus on the main, uh, the main safeguard, which is the one in paragraph three, saying that you know, whoever is subject uh, to an automated decision making uh, has the right to contest the automated decision. Also, okay, very good. That seems, looks great. So we have the right to object. Um, now, this is great on paper. The real problem is that to, to actually enforce the right to object, we need to know, first of all, that we were subject to an automated decision. Um, and then we need to have the time, the money, uh, the willingness, the evidence. Uh, we, we, we need a lot of factual uh, requirements to actually go and fight. And of course, it will be uh, the more harder for us to fight, in the, more, the higher our distress situation will be. So considering that here we are thinking about victims of some kind of accident, uh, or then complaining to an insurance asking for some sort of compensation, the more serious you know, uh, the injury will be, the, most, uh, the more poor the person will be, the less likely uh, this, uh, this kind of provision will be actually enforced. Uh, by, and by, by the way, this provision only gives the right to object, to ask for explanation, to object to the decision, and then you know, the procedure has to go on and the decision has to be made by, by a human. And the things don't go better when we look, you know, this is even something worse if you want, I can get into that, but I will skip that because we are all tired. But I can show you that the thing is not going better in the new Artificial Intelligence Act. I don't know, um, this is uh, almost there. I mean, it just needs to be published in the official journal. Um, and it's uh, lauded as you know, the first act in the world regulating artificial intelligence, which is a little bit you know, an exaggeration uh, of what it actually is. Uh, but inside, um, inside this act, uh, what is interesting is that uh, there is no remedy for those who are subject to a decision driven by artificial intelligence, except except that provision you see there, Article 86, which is obviously inspired by Article 22 GDPR. So it's exactly the same idea. It's always based on the idea that giving information to people is uh, the first remedy you need to provide uh, to them. As you can see, Article 86 says that any affected person who is subject to a decision which is taken by the deployer on the basis of a high risk system, uh, which produces legal effects or similarly significantly affects that person in a way that they consider to have an adverse impact on their health, safety, or fundamental rights, shall have the right to obtain from the deployer clear and meaningful explanation of the role of AI system. So I receive a compensation proposal, a claim settlement, uh, whereby it's written, it has been managed by AI. Uh, I have the right to ask for explanation, okay? That's what the provision says. But actually, that provision doesn't apply to uh, offer for compensation. Why? Because if you read it carefully, and you, you can see it's a lot of words. When they're using all that words, clearly it means they want to limit the scope of application because every single word is an exclusionary, uh, exclusionary rule. So they said, any affected person subject to a decision based on the output of a high-risk AI system. So only a high risk AI triggers that very limited remedy. And in the insurance sector, there is only one use of AI that has been defined under the act as high risk, which is the one you see below. So AI system intended to be used for risk assessment and pricing in relation to natural person for life and health insurances are high risk. Whatever else is not. So I have an accident, the AI says that very likely my damage should be, I don't know, my compensation should be 3,000 euro. I received uh, uh, an offer that for that amount, I have no right to use Article 86 because this is not high risk AI under the AI Act, which doesn't really sound, you know, it's still people's life. So well, anyway, that, that, that is how they decided to do. And so for instance, claims optimization algorithms, trying to find 
uh, what are people's vulnerabilities and try to trigger them to then offer exactly the minimum amount necessary are not high risk and they are perfectly legal and there is no remedy under this new uh, legal architecture. So what is my, my final point? My final point is that uh, all these technological development are actually resulting in predictive justice tools. Somebody before already reminded you, you know, use exactly the same expression to assess damages except that we don't even see them because that occurs before anybody goes to court that occur in a phase that occurs in a phase where lawyers are not even involved you know it's a typically and typically especially for low level uh, claims uh, nobody will ever heard you know of, of, of these cases and we have these you know algorithms that are able actually to settle uh, potential tort law disputes with unknown levels of accuracy rapidity uh, efficiency Precisions and algorithmically induce acceptance because they are able to trigger exactly what what people need to just accept what is proposed to them, uh, and I think that matters for tort law. It matters because you know we already know insurance companies, especially for certain kind of personal injuries, are already the primary uh, locus of relief. So it's where people go, it's where people get compensated and, and all the rest, you know, it's, uh, it's for other kind of injuries. But this kind of technology is going to make insurance companies not only the first place where uh, tort requests are evaluated and assessed, assessed by artificial intelligence, but also the last place where uh, compensations requests are evaluated and assessed because, you know, it, it's tailored in such a way that it essentially uh, uh, prevents people from reacting against any proposal that is made to them. Uh, so that's a very you know, uh, reassuring word uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, and thank you once again very much for your attention.